Well, good morning. You can take the message outline from your bulletin on the yellow sheet. We are looking at life lessons from the book of Jonah. We are covering four chapters in four weeks. Jonah was a lot like us in some ways, reluctant and resistant. God sent him to the city of Nineveh, the largest city in that part of the world, and Jonah is reluctant and resistant and doesn't want to go because he's prejudiced and doesn't believe his nation's enemy is worthy of God's work. So he gets on a boat heading in the opposite direction. God sends a storm. Jonah is thrown off of the boat, swallowed by a fish, repents in the fish, is spit out by the fish, goes to the city of Nineveh, delivers his eight-word sermon, and the entire city is converted. So here's the summary, and this is on your outline. Chapter 1 is Jonah rebelling and running from God. Chapter 2 is Jonah repenting and running back to God. Chapter 3 is Jonah restarting and running with God, although he has a bad attitude. He never gets around to having a good attitude. And in chapter 4, the last chapter, Jonah is regretting and resenting God because God changes his plan and Jonah doesn't like it. So I like to begin by reviewing the mistakes Jonah made. Jonah had his plan for what he wanted to do. God had his plan instead of Jonah's plan. And Jonah is miserable about it. And these things will make you miserable too. Now as we go through the fourth chapter, and as we've been going through the book of Jonah together, obviously we have to stop and make an application of it, right? I mean, if we just look at Jonah and look at the historical event, then it remains a, a, just a historical event. A guy swallowed by a fish, that's what most people remember. So we have to look at it and ask ourselves, what does this mean to me? What are the principles that transcend the historical event that I can apply to my life? So the first thing, first mistake, is Jonah thought that he could ignore God's word. So he runs from God, and as a result, his life is miserable. You and I cannot ignore God and expect to be happy throughout eternity. Amen. Now, I said throughout eternity. There are a lot of people living life who, to use a cliche, have never darkened the door of a church and they're doing fine, beautiful house, beautiful family, beautiful health, beautiful job, beautiful car. So a person can go through life and be happy and not never have God in their life. But at some point, Ignoring God's word will catch up with us and we'll have to give an account as to what we did or did not do. So Jonah runs from God and his life is miserable. Two, second thing, is Jonah was prejudiced against people God created in love. And I'm here to tell you, prejudice will make you miserable. You will be miserable every single day of your life. And three, Jonah was only interested in his nation, not the whole world. He cared more about himself than the salvation of an entire city of people. God said, go to Nineveh and tell them about the word. And Jonah says, no, I am not going to the enemy. Are you out of your mind? Now, I am all for American allegiance. 100% 
for American allegiance. But allegiance to a nation can never be greater than our allegiance to God. Amen. Because if it is, then we have just broken the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before you. And then four, Jonah reluctantly fulfilled his mission with a bad attitude. He goes into the city with his eight-word sermon and says, you guys are all going to die. Bye. I'm out of here. So I've divided chapter 4 into two parts. And in the first part, I want to look at the two mistakes Jonah made. Both of them involve resentment. You think being resentful is holding the person or the group accountable. It's like, well, I'm so resentful. And you think you're holding that person accountable. You think you're holding a group of people accountable when actually all you are doing is making yourself miserable. And the worst kind of resentment is against God. That causes problems. So mistake number one is resenting God's plan when I don't like it. And this is not just a Jonah thing. <clears throat> you have a plan. I'm talking about you as an individual. You have a plan. You have a plan for your career. You have a plan for your finances. You have a plan for your relationships. And when it doesn't happen, you get mad at God. Jonah wanted Nineveh destroyed. God wanted Nineveh saved. So Jonah resents God. And we do the same thing a lot of times when things don't go the way that we want them to go. So in Jonah 3, verse 10, when Jonah saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. <coughs> All of this made Jonah so excited, right? This change of plans upset Jonah. And he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. The people of Nineveh repented, and Jonah is resentful. God changed his mind and is not going to destroy them. So how do you know when you are resentful toward God? Jonah was resentful toward God. There's five ways. There's five emotions that will give you an indication that you have resentment toward God. Now, I want to say something about these before I list them. Sometimes these emotions are internal. Sometimes they're subconscious. These are not always up on the surface where everybody sees them or, or you recognize them. Sometimes these are inside. Number one is frustration. It says this change of plans upset Jonah. When God says, I'm going to save the entire city of Nineveh, it is good news for everyone except Jonah. It creates resentment in his heart. And then there's anger. It says he became very angry. And then there was self-pity. It says he complained to the Lord. He said, oh, poor me. There's not a thing wrong with Jonah except his bad attitude. Amen. And then there's depression in chapter 4 and verse 3. It is better for me to die than to live. Man, if we had the entire city of Mobile repenting, I mean, that's not the time I want to die. <laughs> If we had any given Sunday, 
five people place membership, I'd probably die. <laughs> Out of excitement. <laughs> I remember when that one Sunday when we were at the at the building over here that Sunday when 17 people placed membership and we had them all listed on that was good. And it's gonna happen again. And then suicidal. So now I ask you, Lord, please kill me. Now let me ask you this question. Is any of this rational? I mean, it, it, any of these emotions justified? Jonah knows he has been miraculously preserved by God. I mean, the guy was thrown overboard in a storm, survives inside of a fish, an entire city repents at his bad attitude, eight-word sermon. And now he just wants to die. So listen to this very closely. This is what happens when hate fills your heart. When hate fills your heart toward a person or a group of people, you become frustrated, and the frustration moves to anger, and the anger becomes self-pity, and the self-pity becomes depression, and the depression can even lead to suicidal thoughts. Don't hold hatred in your heart toward any person or any group of people. So I always read articles <coughs> to gather material for these messages. And this one article, I just took one thing out of it. It says sometimes depression is the result of frozen anger. Sometimes we have anger deep inside that's frozen like a big giant iceberg in Antarctica. It's frozen. Never melt. And as long as that anger is frozen inside of us, it's going to continue to generate this frustration, self-pity. All right, number two, enough on that one. Second mistake. Resenting God's mercy and goodness to other people. Jonah is upset that the people of Nineveh have been forgiven by God. You think the guy would be celebrating? So chapter 4, verse 2. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. I know how easily you could cancel your plans for destroying these people. You know what's interesting? Is notice the four things that Jonah knows about God. Now look at this. He knows God is gracious. He knows God is compassionate. He knows God is patient, says he's slow to anger, get angry. And he knows he's filled with unlimited love. Jonah names all of these good qualities of God, but he's still upset. Why? Okay, here's my response. We want forgiveness for ourselves, but not for those we don't like. <laughs> what we want, folks. Amen. Now, we may not be doing it on the scale of Jonah, but we're doing it in our own little world. Amen. There may not be a big fish involved that swallows us, but we're all connecting and understanding Jonah because he's generating human feelings. We all deal with these things. We all deal with the frustration and the anger and the self-pity and the depression and sometimes even suicidal thoughts. If there are some people that you don't want to see forgiven, you have just fallen into the Jonah trap. You've been walking along a, a road and you have fallen into the Jonah trap. And not only that, 
You have put your own faith into jeopardy. Because the book ends. And I can't tell you that Jonah has a good relationship with God going on. So in chapter 4 and verse 3, the entire city's repented. Look at this. Look, here's Jonah. Please kill me, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive when nothing that I told them happens. Another reason Jonah is upset is because he told them that their city was going to be destroyed in 40 days, and now it's not, and he's afraid that it's going to make him look bad. This guy is more worried about his reputation than an entire city of people repenting of their sins and God not destroying it. He's saying, I've told everybody that they're all going to be wiped out in 40 days and now it's not going to happen. I'm going to look bad. Yeah. And I'm not going to feel good. And they're going to say, oh, you know, Jonah has a bad reputation. He said it was going to happen and it didn't happen. Oh, Jonah, you're no good. <laughs> So in the second half of the chapter, God teaches Jonah an object lesson. And we're going to call this four things to... I don't mean for this to be humorous. It's just the whole story. It's kind of interesting because it's so human, isn't it? We all identify with it. Four things to remember when life isn't going your way. Now God's going to use as a couple of strange object lessons. That's not unusual in the Old Testament, right? You remember when they were building that place for the prophets, the prophets, and they used a borrowed axe, and they were swinging the axe, the axe head came off and it went into the river and sank, and God made the axe head float to the surface, and I had a whole Sunday morning sermon on the floating axe head. Probably about time to redo the floating axe head. So there's strange stuff in the Old Testament, but we had to just look beyond it and ask ourselves, okay, what is the lesson? What does this mean to us? Number one is remember that God can see things I can't see. Jonah is all upset about God forgiving Nineveh and not destroying the city. And so he asked him a question. Chapter 4, verse 4. Then the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry about this? Jonah, why are you angry over the people I have forgiven? When God has a plan different from your plan, you can't get upset about it because he sees things that you don't see. The Lord is not limited by time. And so we have to be willing to trust in God's wisdom. So Jonah leaves the city to see what's going to happen. Chapter 4, verse 5. Then Jonah went out to the east side. We're heading to the, I'm heading to the east side, man. I'm going to the east side of town. Jonah went out to the east side of the city, made a shelter to sit under it as he waited to see if anything would happen to the city. You see, Jonah, in his mind, is still hoping that God is going to destroy Nineveh. And so he sets up his lawn chair, pours an iced tea, and waits. Now it's really hot, and he doesn't have a beach umbrella. I mean, I don't know, it's a lot of desert around Nineveh, right? Modern Musel. A lot of desert around there, so you probably need to take a beach umbrella if you're going there, but I don't know, that's probably the place you want to go and sit out in the sun. Apparently this shelter that he had built for himself was not, was not very good. And so God does something unusual to serve as an object lesson. And that brings us to number two, which is, remember that God is good to me even when I don't deserve it. In chapter 4 and verse 6, did you get that last point? Okay, I didn't mean to go through it fast. Then the Lord arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. So he's out here in his lawn chair. And soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head. I guess it came up in a matter of maybe 
hour, I don't know, shading him from the sun. This eased some of his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Even though Jonah doesn't deserve it, God makes him comfortable. And this word arranged, we just read, then the Lord arranged for a leafy plant. It is the same Hebrew word used in chapter 1, verse 17, where it says God prepared or appointed or arranged a fish to swallow Jonah. So God arranged a fish and he arranged this plant. Now here's the application, because we have to ask ourselves, what's the application? God cares for you even when you are a jerk and don't deserve it. <laughs> How many times have you enjoyed life's comforts, and we'll just let this leafy plant represent the comforts that most people, many people enjoy, enjoy in American society, house, air conditioning, heater, clothes. How many times have we enjoyed life's comforts when we didn't deserve it? So what I get out of this is that God loves you even when you are unloving. God loved Jonah even when he was unloving and undeserving. God still provides shade for him. This is what I call the grace of God. Amen. And I think we can make a spiritual application of it fairly easy, right? Amen. Then three is remember God is in control of every detail. Every detail. God uses this plant that gives Jonah shade for one day as an object lesson to show that he is in control of all the details. Verse 7. But God also arranged for a worm. Same word in 117, arranged for a fish. Same word in verse 6, arranged the plant for a plant. Now, arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, <laughs> this I do find kind of humorous. The worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it soon died and withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God sent a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint, wished to die. Death is certainly better than this, he exclaimed. <laughs> so God has been doing a lot of arranging in this guy's life. He arranged a storm. He arranged the dice. He arranged a fish. He arranged a leafy plant. And now he arranged a worm to eat the plants. God arranged for something to make him comfortable. And then he arranged for something to make him uncomfortable. Why? Why would God give you something comfortable, like a shade tree, and then the next day send a worm to eat it? to tell you, this is the application, to tell you that he doesn't want you to sit under a shade tree for the rest of your life with a bad attitude. <laughs> Remember that everything God does is motivated by love and wants you to be saved. And God uses both great things, big things, and small things to teach us. Amen. He uses, and of course we have to make the application to whatever it is going on in your life. He uses big things like a giant fish. 
He uses small things like a worm. Now we can make an application of that to things going on in our lives. There's some things that are very, we call them big and, and obvious that God is using to teach you things. And there are things going on in our lives not quite as big as a, a fish or a big problem that you're facing. Sometimes he uses small things to teach us. It's important for us to remember that he can see things we can't see. There is a song called Waymaker. Maybe I put it on your outline. Okay. I don't know who wrote it. And I didn't take the time to see who originally sang it. I know there's a number of versions of it. Maybe you've heard of Waymaker. I listened to it on YouTube. This is just one line. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. So God is working in your life when you can't see it in the small stuff. Working in your life when you can't feel it. We don't always feel it. I don't know. You wake up every morning and you're like, oh, yeah, this Christianity feels good today. <laughs> and most days, but not every single day. Do you believe that when Joseph in the Old Testament, when he was in prison, do you think that guy woke up every morning and said, oh, it's good to be a believer. Oh, I love those prison bars. <laughs> oh, I love the prison food here. It's just great. <laughs> So Jonah's shade tree, or plant, doubts. Verse 9. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes! <laughs> yes, Jonah said, even angry enough to die. That's the last we hear from the guy. That's it. Jonah still doesn't get the object lesson. Oh, there's hope for you and me. There is so much hope for you and me. I read through Jonah and I'm thinking, oh, yes, Bruce, you still will have hope in the eyes of the Lord. So that brings us to the fourth point. I think we need to remember that people will last, that should be longer than plants. People will last longer than then plants. So let me make a suggestion. If you're going to get upset about something, let's get upset about something that's going to last. Jonah is all worried about a plant that God sends a worm to kill and teach the brevity of life. This guy is all worried about a plant more than he's worried about people. A plant versus people. So in verse 10, Then the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant. Poor, poor leafy plant. Poor plant. Though you did nothing to put it there. And the plant is only at best short-lived. Yeah, try one day on this one. But Nineveh, Nineveh, has more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. That should be left. Not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't you feel sorry for such a great city? You're all bent out of shape over a plant. What about a city with 120,000 babies. That's how I interpret the 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand. I'm assuming this is babies or small children. There are some commentators who interpret it to, to mean 120,000 people who don't uh, have any moral knowledge. They're morally ignorant. I just go with the, the babies and small children. God is saying, Jonah, you care more about your own comfort than an entire city of a million people. Because if there's 120,000 babies, there's a lot of adults. Man, there's a lot of adults. 
I wonder how many babies there are. I wonder how many children under five in Mobile and Baldwin counties. I don't know. I don't know. But you have 120,000 small children and babies. You have a lot of people, right? You have a lot of people. He should have been more concerned about people than a plant. A plant comes, a plant goes, and in God's dramatic object lesson, he has his plant for one day, and then it worm causes it to die the next day. But we need to be concerned about cities. And we're concerned about everybody. But as of 2018, 55% of the world's population lives in cities or urban areas or metropolitan areas. And by the year 2018, 50, and by that year, Hank and I will have a little age on us. 68% of the world's population will live in cities. So are we going to care more for a plant that gives us comfort for one day than for the salvation of people created by God who will live forever? God wants us to invest in something that's going to outlast our own lives, and that's people. Plants don't, well, I guess some plants live a long time, but this plant did not live very long. But the impact that he had on the city of Nineveh and the thousands of people who repented and their souls will be in heaven, that's eternally good and eternally lasting. And so we want to invest in things that are going to last forever, and there's two things. That's the Word of God and people. And so we want to make sure that we keep our focus where it needs to be. Nothing wrong with creature comforts. Nothing wrong with you having a nice leafy, leafy plant to go home to. Nothing wrong with you driving a nice leafy car. Nothing wrong with a leafy bank account. Nothing wrong with leafy clothes. Leaves are fine. But we need to remember that the spiritual priorities are important. And that there are some things that are going to last forever. And that's people's souls. So we can enjoy the things the Lord has given us and even love them to some degree. But we don't want the temporary things to cloud our view of the spiritual priorities God wants us to have. So I'd like for us to conclude with a prayer. And it's at the end of the outline. And so I'll pray it or read it. I guess you can... There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't read a prayer, right? Not, I haven't read anything unless it's in like the third Corinthians or somewhere. <laughs> There's only two Corinthians. Of course, there was one before 1 Corinthians, so 1 Corinthians is probably a 2 Corinthians. But that's another story. You'll bow with me. Father, help me to remember that you see things I can't see. I know you're good to me even when I don't deserve it. Many times you have taken care of my discomfort even when I was ignoring you. I know you are in control of every detail, big and small. I don't want to worry about things that won't last, like plants. Instead, I want to focus on what's really going to last, your word and people. Fill me with love and confidence, and help me to never forget your forgiveness. I want to be gracious toward other people as you have been gracious toward me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a need, please let us know what it is while we stand and sing. Uh.